talk about something very different than technical design right now. Um, we're going to talk about burnout. So question for everyone in the audience, um, if you're brave enough to raise your hand, how many people have had an experience at some point in your career feeling like you were burned out? That's, wow, that is actually more hands than I expected to see in Germany, where you have stronger labor laws than we have in the US. Um, how many people have a loved one or a friend who has gone through a, a, an experience with burnout? Yeah, so I think just about for the audience online, I think we saw just about every hand go up. Um, well, you're not alone. Research shows that stress levels among, uh, I feel like I'm covering my slides, stress, stress levels among workers globally are at uh, close to an all-time all high. So the question is, why is this happening? How is this affecting designers? And what is it that we can do for ourselves and our teams? So that's what we'll talk about. Um, I'm going to share my own personal journey with burnout, which of course culminated in the publication of my book on the topic about 10 years ago. After the book came out, lots and lots of people read the book, and I literally have heard from thousands of people around the world about their struggles with burnout. So we're going to talk a bit about the conditions that lead to burnout, and then uh, we'll talk a bit about what's unique about the design role and maybe some of the other things that may affect designers, and then we'll talk about what we can do. So first, the bad news. <laughs> Burnout is definitely a global problem. In the US, where I live, more than half of US workers will report uh, experiencing burnout at some point in their careers. But it's not just an American problem. Globally, burnout levels have been consistently high. And here's a chart. So this is a study that Gallup has been doing for decades. And what they found was that in the pandemic, uh, we reached an all-time high, since, high as it, since it's been recorded. 44% of workers reported experiencing significant amounts of stress the previous day. That's come down a little bit since we're supposedly in a po post-pandemic world, but it hasn't actually gone down that much. And it's costing businesses money. This is actually a business issue close to $9 trillion a year. Um, that's, that's the Gallup estimate. And that's, of course, because when a team member burns out, it has an effect on the entire team. It affects our productivity. It affects morale. Um, it affects attrition, all of these things. But the issue is also personal to me. So I'm going to share a bit about my story. This is a picture of me. Um, from, I guess that was about 17 years ago. I think I'm actually pregnant in the picture, but you can't tell, because uh, my back is to the camera. Um, so this was me at work. At the time, I was managing a growing team of designers at an award-winning boutique design firm in San Francisco. It was my first job in management, which was really exciting. It was also really stressful, because if any of you have had this experience, maybe you'll, this will resonate, but no one teaches you how to be a manager. You're a rock star practitioner, and then you get promoted into this job that you have no idea how to do. So I was in that stage of my career. Um, and it was, it was a little disconcerting. I was doing OK, but I was dealing with some of the, some of the anxiety that is normal in that um, stage. And then meanwhile, I had this growing team at home. So I had two beautiful girls under the age of five. And that's, of course, my husband, Brian, in the middle. And he worked full time. He also worked as a UX designer, freelance. And so he often worked very long hours, just like I did. It was a lot for us to, to tackle as two working parents. Um, but we were making it work. We had good communication skills, and, and we were sorting stuff out. And then this little guy came along. This is our son, Jake. And after he was born, I did what you know, Americans do, and I took not enough time off of work. We, I actually took four months, which was considered a pretty long maternity leave in the US, and had time to bond with my baby and recover. And then I went back to work at four months, and he went into daycare. Now, Brian and I were not naive about what we had taken on. So, you know, we, we knew it would be harder. We knew we would have to up our game as working parents. But we were designers, and we were consultants. So we had amazing problem-solving skills. 
So every week we would sit down at the kitchen table. This is a stock photo. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, we would sit down at the kitchen table and we would plan out our week. And then Brian would make these elaborate Excel spreadsheets that were color-coded and they were in half-hour increments from the moment we woke up in the morning or the moment we were supposed to wake up in the morning until the moment our head hit the pillow at night. And these schedules, which I have tried to dig up and I couldn't find one, they're, you know, this is like going back 17 years, so I wish I could show you the real thing. Um, but this schedule had so much power in our lives because we, we almost had this like religious belief that if we could just stick to the plan, everything would be fine. We would have everything we wanted. John Lennon is famous for saying, life is what happens when you're making plans. The problem with our plan is that it didn't account for things like the dog needing to go to the vet suddenly, or a kid getting sick, or Brian getting a flat tire on the way to a client office, or my train being late to work. Any of these things could set off this cascade of issues that meant the plan was completely out the window. So we were muddling along, and meanwhile I was juggling multiple projects at work, and every day it felt like I was falling further behind. And so I told myself, you know what? I just need to try harder because that is always how I had solved problems in the past, and it had always worked. So I tried harder. Trying harder meant I had to give up some things. So I stopped seeing friends, I stopped doing date nights with Brian, stopped going to the gym so much, and eventually I started cutting back on sleep. And still it wasn't enough. I was still falling behind. And even though I hated to admit it, and I wouldn't admit it at the time, I was starting to fall apart. So one day, after months of this, I woke up, and I was sick, and so I didn't go into work that day, and then I didn't go into work the next day, and then I didn't go into work the next day, and at some point, it became clear that I was never going back to the job that I loved. And I didn't plan it. It wasn't a choice, even though it may have looked like a choice. I had completely burned out. I was depressed, I was anxious, I was having panic attacks in the middle of the night when I should have been sleeping, and it was obvious that I could not go back to that way of life. And I think it's really hard for people who have not had an experience like that to understand what serious burnout is. Because on the surface, I looked fine. There were no broken bones, there were no wounds, I wasn't bleeding, but I was falling apart inside and I couldn't live that life anymore. So I quit my job. So burnout can affect anyone, but parents are one of the groups that tend to be on the front lines of this issue. And later when I started researching it, I found out that working moms and actually women in general are more at risk for burnout at work than their male colleagues. And part of that has to do with this double role that we play, where we have, we, for various reasons, we tend to take on more of the housework and the childcare or elder care, the caring of people outside of our lives. And at work, we tend to take on more of the emotional labor. And that, takes, that comes at a cost sometimes. But as I started doing more research and talking to more people, and I, I started blogging about the issue, I realized that all kinds of people burn out. It's not just mothers. It's not just women. I started hearing from fathers. And what the research shows is that as men have been taking on more responsibility with their kids, Unfortunately, they're also starting to report higher levels of burnout at work because they're in the same bind that women are. Um, other caregivers, people taking care of parents. And eventually I started hearing from all kinds of people, including people who did not have kids and did not have elderly parents. They simply were overworked, sometimes working in very toxic situations, and it was taking a toll on their health. So a lot of time has passed since I wrote about this issue and did all this research. And actually, the level of burnout has gone up, not down. And it's not only about the pandemic, although that has definitely been a factor. So I started thinking, well, what's changed? And I think one of the trends that is really interesting is about our relationship with technology. It's actually shifted pretty significantly in the last couple years. Um, there's... Um, I have to call out that this is really ironic because most of us work in tech. 
And many of us are designing the tools that are supposed to liberate us. We're designing the technology that is supposed to make our lives better. It's supposed to make us more productive. It's supposed to help us you know, be, make our jobs easier. Um, it's supposed to help us find information faster and connect to each other across distance. And all these things are true. But um, unfortunately, tech that's supposed to make us more human seems to be having the opposite effect. So I now work for a company called Accenture Song. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And one of the things I like about working at a big company like Accenture is we have the resources and the wherewithal to generate some really interesting research reports. So one of the trend reports we put together every year is called uh, Life Trends. And you can get the whole report if you're interested and you Google Accenture Song, Life Trends, you'll see this year's report. We're now working on next year's report. I got a sneak peek, it's really interesting. But one of the trends in this year's report is called we call it error 429. Do, does anyone know what an error 429 is? I'm sure someone does, because we all work in tech. No? No one. OK, good. Well, I'll tell you. Um, so imagine if everyone in this conference, plus a million of our best friends, suddenly decided to buy Taylor Swift tickets. That would be an error 429. We would crash the website. So, Error 429 is when humans overwhelm technology and they crash technology. But what we're seeing in the report right now is it's going the other way. Technology is overwhelming humans and it's crashing us. And this is really just, we've hit a tipping point in the last couple years. I've looked at the data and it's really interesting. So yes, tech can do all the things we said. It can improve our lives and connect us and make our jobs easier, but it comes at a cost. And part of the cost is that it's made us more distracted, a lot more distracted. In some ways, it's isolated us from each other because now we're looking at our phones instead of talking to strangers in the bus or whatever. Um, and it's given us more to do. It comes with its own demands on our time and attention. And I think that's, that is a piece of the stress that has ratcheted up since I first started talking about this topic. OK, so what about designers? So, so far, I'm talking about just the human condition and, and how we're making our way in this world. But how is this issue specifically affecting designers? Because I know a lot of stressed out designers. I've met a bunch of you at the conference. I've heard all kinds of stories. It seems like when people hear about the talk I'm giving, everyone has a story about going through this. So what is specific to designers? So in prepping for this talk, I posed this question to my network on LinkedIn, basically asking, you know, what is it as designers that um, affects your stress level at work, and what do you need in the workplace so that you can thrive? I got a ton of answers and very thoughtful, um, interesting answers. But what it came down to was these four theme or these five themes. So the first one is about unrealistic deadlines. I think this came up in some of the talks earlier today. The pressure to deliver high quality work that designers feel when they're often working on deadlines, often did not set those deadlines, is really, really intense. Uh, one of the commenters talked about changing requirements and how we'll have a scope of work and you know, you're working toward a plan, and you have a launch date, and then some, suddenly an executive comes in with a big new strategy, and it throws everything up in the air, and then we need to rethink everything. But somehow, we're supposed to get the design work done on time. So that's definitely a big source of stress for designers. Add to that high expectations of our bosses, of our coworkers and cross-functional partners, expectations of our stakeholders, if you're in consulting of your client, but also it's our own expectations. And I, I heard that a lot at the conference just earlier today in lunch conversations, people talking about how, you know, the bar I set for myself is so high. I'm my worst boss. I'm, <laughs> I'm the hardest person to please. And so that's definitely something, I don't think that's unique to design, but I think because because of the nature of design work, because it's subjective, because it's something that we often present, um, it's creative, the expectations are an issue. Lack of autonomy. A lot of designers feel that they have limited control over the projects and the outcomes of those projects, and they find themselves working in these very stressful, reactive um, environments. 
Then there's the undervalued work piece. And I think there's something very specific to design work here. I've done so much thinking about this as, as someone who's been leading some really big teams recently. Why is it that I'm still explaining to executives what design is, that it's more than fonts and colors, that it actually determines the, you know, the success of your product? I've met so many designers who told me that they have to explain to their, their engineers and product managers why they should be allowed in the meeting, why they should be able to participate in the work that they were paid to do. So imagine a lawyer trying to explain to people why they should be allowed to practice law, or a doctor trying to explain to people why they should be allowed to practice good health care. That is something, for some reason, that seems to, um, to plague our industry a bit. And then the last piece is around inadequate support. And I would be remiss if I didn't make a nod to the layoffs that we were talking about in the panel earlier today. There's so much anxiety and stress um, just around this feeling that our jobs are insecure. There's a lot of turmoil in the tech industry all, all over the world right now. Um, part of that means that in the layoffs, a lot of design leaders have been laid off. They're the most expensive people. And that means that a lot of designers who used to report to a design leader are now reporting to someone who does not have a design background, does not necessarily understand what they do, and doesn't necessarily know how to advocate for them. That creates a lot of stress. All right, so what do we do about it? <laughs> we only control what we can control. Um, so the rest of this presentation is going to be about talking about the things that you can do for yourself and for your team, and these are the things that you can control. So I'm not gonna try to solve all the issues in the design industry. This is more about kind of regrounding on things that we know, um, but my guess is, even if you know these things, my guess is there's at least one of them you're probably not really doing. So hopefully, you will find at least one thing in the rest of this presentation that's a reminder to you that you can take back into your life. All right, first one is about setting boundaries. Super simple, I know you've heard this a thousand times. Everyone needs to set boundaries. Why is it so hard to set boundaries? Does anyone find this easy? I, no, seriously, like raise your hand if you find this easy to do. Two people, okay, find those two people in the back of the room afterwards. I find it really hard, so what was that? Have a baby, that makes it harder and easier. It does give you a reason to go home, it's true. <laughs> I don't, I, personally, I wouldn't recommend that as a, a de-stressing technique since I wrote a book about burning out as a working mom, but that is, that is true. Um, so a lot of us have trouble saying no. No is a really ugly word. In fact, we talked this morning about yes and, and we all love yes and because it's a way to build on an idea without having to make anyone feel bad, and yes and is great. But sometimes we actually have to say no because if we just say yes to all the requests, we will never get anything done and we will all burn out. Um, my husband used to write say no on his to-do list, which I think is really funny, but he's a planner. And so it was like he kind of gamified the idea that he didn't want to say no to anyone, he didn't want to let anyone down, but it was on his to-do list. And then he loved to cross it off at the end of the day. Um, the question is, how do you, or the answer is actually, that there are ways to say no without actually saying the word no. So sometimes it's not appropriate to just flat out say no. As we move up in our career, we need to get more and more skillful. And I love that I see like half the people in the audience taking pictures of this. Because the thing I was going to say next is, um, take this list and make it your own. This is my list. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but I'll, I'll point out a few. But add your ideas to this list. So what I have are things like, the deferral, you know, maybe you're not exactly saying no, but it's just not now. Let's check in in a month, right? Or um, you could uh, use the number five. This one is a really good technique, especially when your manager is asking you to do something and you feel like you absolutely can't say no. But you know what you can say? Sure, but it means I'd have to put this other thing on hold that you care about. So which one do you want me to do? And then you give them the power to make the choice. So you're not being obstructive, but you're, you're facing reality. And then, of course, you can always go with number four, which is the actual truth. Look, I'm slammed. I would love to do it, but I just can't do it right now. 
Okay, so practice self-care, this is such a cliche. Actually, when I wrote my book, I thought I was writing like the anti-self-help uh, self book, and then I sold it to a publisher and they categorized it under self-help, and I called them and I was like, why are you doing that? And they were like, well, everyone wants self-help. <laughs> so I need to talk about the, the self-care because I know everyone needs it. There are many books that are written about all the things you need to do. Here's my message. You are not just a pair of eyeballs looking at a screen. You're not just a brain in a sack of flesh. You are a whole human body with human needs. You need healthy food. You need to hydrate. You need adequate sleep. You need human connection because you're not just a, an animal, you're a mammal. And so that's how we're programmed. We need each other. So these are important and we need to prioritize them. For me, one of the big self-care things is exercise. Um, I find that, that exercise is like an antidepressant. And then I read about it, and it turns out it's actually about as effective as an antidepressant for a lot of people. So for me, I've had to figure out how do you get exercise when you have absolutely no time to get exercise. And this is my cheat sheet. Maybe one of these things will work for you. If you have a commute, can you bike? Can you walk? I've done both. I think it's a great way to start your day. You get to the office, and you're, you're already feeling kind of refreshed and ready. Um, there's such a thing called a treadmill desk. I was an early adopter of the treadmill desk more than 10 years ago when they were really expensive and big and bulky, and it got me through long days when I couldn't leave the house and I was on meetings all the time. I can actually type very effectively walking two miles an hour. Um, the technology's gotten better since I bought mine, so definitely see what's out there if you work from home. Um, walking meetings with a coworker. You can, if you're having a one-on-one, -on -one, maybe everyone wants to get outside and have a walking meeting. If you're virtual, maybe you both get on the phone and you do your meeting that way. Short exercise breaks can actually be very effective. There's a lot of science around this. So if you have a half hour, you're working from home, and you're, you have a half hour between calls, that's enough time to do a 10-minute high-intensity interval training workout. And the science shows that it's really, really good for you, and it will change your kind of how you feel and your mental state. And then you can wipe off the sweat and get back on camera. Um, or do a break and take, do some yoga stretches, turn on your favorite song and do a dance break. And then um, in a pinch, when I've been on really long meetings, sometimes I'll just turn off the camera and I'll just do a bunch of push-ups or something just to move. OK, seek support. I'm curious, how many people here have someone in your life that you're responsible for? A child, an elderly parent, someone? Oh, it's a lot. That's like maybe a third, a little more than a third of the room. Um, how many feel at home, whether or not you have family you take care of, that you do more than your share of household chores? And Oh, not as many hands. That makes me happy. OK, people have really egalitarian relationships here in, in Germany. Um, well, my, my next piece of advice, actually, one, one other question. How many of you feel that you're doing your, more than your share at work? And it could be the spoken work, or it could be the unspoken work, the emotional labor, like planning events and cleaning up. How many feel they're doing more? Actually, a lot more hands went up on that one than on the, on the household one. OK, so my advice here is more for couples, but the advice really applies to everyone. You've, we've got to find ways to enlist other people to help us. If we're doing more than our share, whether it's at home or at work, we need to invite others in to help do the work. For those at home who need help figuring this out, there's a book that a lot of people have read and told me it helped them a lot called Getting to 50-50. And it's all about how to have that conversation in a couple. And this comes up not only with heterosexual couples, it comes up with same-sex couples as well. OK, new topic. How many of you? find that regularly you work more than 40 hours a week. Oh, that's, OK, that's interesting. It's about close to half the room. I'm in Germany with good labor laws, so I didn't know how many people were going to say yes to that question. How many feel that you're working, you regularly work more than 50 hours? OK, fewer hands, but I'm seeing some hands. Anyone find that they're working like more than 55 hours a week? Yeah, there's still hands, more than 60 hours a week. OK, my advice for you, starting today, is <laughs> you have got to find a way to work less. And I'm going to arm you with the facts. 
Working less does not mean you're slacking off. There has been more than a century of science around this idea of productivity and how the study after study after study, how many hours can we squeeze out of a worker and still be productive? The good and bad news is that knowledge workers have about four to six hours of peak productivity, productivity in a day. That's when you're really humming, you're getting stuff done, you're thinking clearly. You can keep working after that, most of us do, but your productivity will start to go down, and that's okay. But if you keep working past eight hours, and you do that day after day after day, eventually you enter what's called a negative productivity cycle. And I'm talking about being really chronically overworked, where at that point you are making more problems than you are solving problems, which means you're actually creating work for your coworkers versus getting things done. So I tell you this to say, if you feel you're on the edge where you're working too much, this is your permission to find ways to stop because it's not just for you, it's for your workplace and for the team you work with. How many of you are managing teams? Okay, about a third of the hands. So the advice here can apply to everyone, but it's in particular, it's for managers. A big part of our job in managing, managing teams at work is to clear a path so people can get their best work done. And that means that part of our job is to look out for issues around burnout and make sure that we're, we're doing what we need to do so our team can thrive, right? So my, my first piece of advice around that is be an example. Take your vacations. And don't hide the fact that you're taking your vacations. And I realize I'm saying this in Germany, so maybe I'm really speaking back to, in, <laughs> to my American colleagues. We're, we're not good about taking our vacations. But I have seen so many leaders pretend they're not on vacation. They'll go to Bermuda or some exotic location, and then they'll still get on work calls, and they'll try to hide the fact that they're actually supposed to be on a vacation. That's not helpful to your team. I think it's much more helpful to your team to tell everyone you're taking time off Tell them that you'll be unplugging. Tell them who they can contact in your absence, and then go. Because what you're doing is you're not just taking time off. You're giving them permission to really take time off. You're modeling for them. Promote flexibility. This part definitely got better with the pandemic. I think there were a lot of naysayers about things like working from home. And then when we all had to work from home, suddenly, uh, you know, uh, the executives of the world realize, oh, actually, people can be quite productive working from home. There's now a movement um, that we're seeing at a lot of companies to get everyone back in the office. Let's not lose what's great about flexibility. Being able to work from home at least part of the time, um, flexible work schedules, being able to make, put some of the work in an asynchronous tool like Slack, this will help your team manage their life around work. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Foster a supportive work culture. This is kind of an intangible, but um, it's so critical, especially for design. <clears throat> Our teams do creative work. No one can think creatively when they're hunkered in fear that someone's going to criticize their idea. So in order to run an innovative team, in order to you know, really, really create an environment where your team can do great creative work, we have to create an environment of psychological safety. People need to feel like it's OK to take a risk and sometimes make a mistake. Um, if you don't know how to do this, this is definitely the book for you. I used to work with Minette Norman, one of the authors. She's the real deal. She's a wonderful leader. And she's codified all, you know, all these tips and techniques for how to create that kind of environment as a leader. And then my last piece of advice is the one I, I need to work on more. And it's about making room for play. I think when we're so busy, it is so easy for us to get in sort of task mode and cross things off our list. But to be creative, to innovate, to come up with new ideas, we also need that white space. We need time to daydream. We need to um, be able to test out ideas and not really know where it's going to go. So there's a lot of different ways we can do this. When I posted on LinkedIn, um, one of the commenters talked about 
doing this uh, structured um, meeting with her team called Creative Kitchens, and they take random inspiration from the week and then see what they can cook up. And that made me think of an event we had in our Brooklyn office recently. I walked in and all these designers were, it wasn't just the designers, the product managers and the engineers, everyone was crowded around the kitchen table and they'd set up these, um, they were doing a tasting event. They'd set up all these snack bowls um, that were new product lines that were being promoted by celebrities. <laughs> and they, they like designed it so you can see like who the celebrity is behind the bacon popcorn and then everyone tasted the snacks. And it was so silly. It had nothing to do with work, but it was just playful and it created, you know, new ideas and kind of rejuvenated everyone. So to summarize for yourself, set the boundaries, find ways to say no even if you don't use the word no. Practice self-care. Pick that one thing that you know you should be doing, but you're not doing it yet, and make a commitment to start working that into your life. Seek support. If you are doing more than your share, get others to help you at home and at work, and then work less. And for your team, be an example. Take your vacations. Make sure they know that you're unplugging. Promote flexibility. Get to know your team. I didn't really say this before, but get to know them a bit. Everyone's got a different situation in their life, and that'll help you figure out what, what is actually needed so they can be successful. Foster a supportive culture. Get Manette's book if you don't know how to do that, and make room for play. All right, so I left you with a cliffhanger. You may have guessed. Um, but I, uh, things worked out okay for me. <laughs> After I burned out and I quit, I ended up spending a year kind of soul searching and writing, and that writing, of course, ended up being the beginning of what ended up being my book that was published five years later. But after about a year of that, I went back into the workforce, and um, my career hasn't missed a beat. I've, and I say this because often women listen, um, you know, I'm often talking to groups of women, and they're worried that if they take time off, they'll never be able to get back. But I was able to do that. And I've had a great career. I've been leading bigger and bigger product design teams. And I found my way to Accenture Song. Now, I've been very, very picky about what companies I work with and what leaders I will work with, in, including who I will work for. And I think that's really critical. Um, so I landed in a company, Accenture Song is part of Accenture, a giant global company. Song is the creative arm. We are the largest tech-powered creative group. And um, one thing I love about the place I picked to work is that our CEO is a creative. So he, he inherently understands the power of creativity and design, and I find that I'm surrounded by these leaders who value what I do for a living. Um, and then the other thing I, about picking my workplace is I picked a place that is very intentional about inclusion and making room for all kinds of people, and that's evidenced by all the awards that we've won recently. So my message is, Sometimes you're not in the right place for you, and only you know if that's true. But there is a right place for you, so, and I know it's a tough job market right now, but be selective. Remember that, you know, your life matters, and, the, and where you choose to work will have a big impact. You deserve to be in a place that treats you well. Um, so as we wrap up, I want to leave you with this last thought. We've been talking about work, work, work. Life is about a lot more than work. It's about joy. It's about personal growth. It's about connection. Make sure that you are being intentional about the kind of life you're creating. Be courageous. Your life is yours to design. Thank you.